that we might afflict ourselves before our doubt to seek the right way. Somebody says the right way. There are so many ways you could do anything in your life, but there is always a right way. And right way, not, a, not as of men, but right way by God. Did you get that? There are so many ways you could do a thing, but there is always a right way. And not right way by the standards of men, but right way by the standards of God. How could your good be evil spoken of if it is good? It is only God who calls it good and it becomes good. That is why the Bible says, even with your good, make sure that evil is not spoken of it. So it's not everything that is good by the standards of men is good by God. Please understand that. What men call good might not necessarily be good by God. If that which men are calling good doesn't meet the approval of God, it's not good yet. It must meet the approval of God. So look at what the Bible says. He says, we want God to show us the right way. And not just the right way for only me. God has to show us the right way even for our children. This 21 days must build something in the lives of our teenagers. That even when they are being led astray by social media, by their friends, that conviction of God in their spirit will lead them on the right path. Your prayers should be able to do that. And he says also for our substance. So God is giving us clarity for every department of our lives. And if you believe it, say amen. I didn't hear you. Do you believe God is bringing you clarity? Oh yes, I'm ready for that. In Jesus' mighty name. Give me verse 22. And then we'll read 23 as well. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king saying, 23. That scripture was in full though. The 22. Saying the hand of our God is upon all of them. For good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. 23. So we fasted and besought our God for this. And he was entreated of us. Would that be the same thing you say this morning? That after 21 days, the Lord has indeed entreated us. He's given us clarity. Man, I've gotten some great clarity in this 21 days. I don't know about you. Things that I was confused about, things that I wasn't even aware of, God began to expose them. Clarity is not just giving you understanding concerning a thing. There are hidden things that must become bare. You didn't get that. There are things that are hidden from you. When clarity comes, clarity is not just God speaking back to you. It is uncovering stuff. But some of you, things were hidden before you. During these 21 days, they were uncovered. And that is clarity. Lift your right hand. Say, Lord, I'm ready. I need clarity. Right now. In my life. I need clarity. Concerning my work with you. Lord, grant me clarity. Concerning my ministry. Grant me clarity. Of that which I need to do in the house of God. I need clarity concerning my career. Lord, grant me clarity concerning what I need to do for business, for schooling, for job. Lord, grant me clarity concerning my marriage. Who am I supposed to be with? Who am I supposed to marry? Lord, grant me clarity. Concerning my family, Lord, grant me clarity. Concerning my relationship, I need clarity. Concerning every department of my life, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to Jesus. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, still talking about clarity. Ezra and his men, from the scripture we just read, were positioned 
at a river called the river of love. And so, for you to receive from God, you need to be positioned at that same location. Isn't it amazing? Of all the places Ezra and his men could have declared fasting, they decided to declare their fasting by the river of Ahava, the river of love. Now, you can't get it wrong when you pitch yourself in God, because that river is God himself. That river is God himself. Understand that. Bible says God is love. So how could you get it wrong when you are positioned in God? And so they positioned themselves, they pitched at a place of love and began to seek the face of God for clarity. A man without love is a man living in total darkness. There is no illumination. That is why these 21 days cannot end with you still having grudge. Hurt, bitterness, resentment against anybody. Jesus meant it when he removed the boundaries and stretched it. He said, you must even love your enemies. And the Bible says, owe no man anything but what? Love. And love is the central message of the gospel of the kingdom of our God. That is why I believe in the assignment God has given Love Legacy Chapel. Loving God and loving people. That is the assignment. And the Bible says that do every effort to live peaceably with all men. Because there are certain people that it's almost impossible to live with. It's impossible. But the Bible says that do everything possible to live peaceably with all men. Not some men. All men. It means if you're having a problem living with some people, you must find a solution from God. God, help me. I'm not going to allow this thing to linger on. Lord, I need a solution because this is not where you want me to be concerning people. People will hurt you. People will do terrible things to you. But in the midst of it, your place is not to seek vengeance. It is to ask God, what more can I do to get this thing working? What more can I do to love them? It is difficult to love them, but what more can I do? And there is always more. I said there is always more. (laughs) The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that is the chapter of love. Bible says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and I have no love, I am becoming like a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and in the midst of all that, Bible says, if I have no love, I am nothing. I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have no love, it has no profit. Why we must focus on love and talk about love. You know, when Jesus came, there was ten commandments. And there was ten commandments given by God. We know that, right? And beside that, the Jewish people or the children of Israel had 413 laws. They created so they couldn't break, they wouldn't break the ten commandments. They had all those laws. But when Jesus came, he said, you know what? Just do these two things. If you do it, you've done all the commandments. Both the 10 and the 413. He says, love God and love your neighbor. And that is the fulfillment of all the commandments. Amen. Number four says, love suffereth long. Love is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunted not itself. Love is not puffed up. We've spoken about all these over the last couple of weeks. Number five, look at what the Bible says. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. In fact, that is where I'm going to focus on. Because all the uh, um, attributes of that which is not love or which is love, we've dealt with. And I'm on this point. Seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. And as we close this season of fasting, that is the word of God I want to bring to you. Selfless and not selfish. Any man that is full of love is not a man that seeketh 
his own. You hear people say, this is America. Now, if you're a Christian, you don't say, this is America. This is the kingdom of God. Bible says we live in this world, but we are not of this world. So we might be living in America, but we belong to a kingdom that is bigger than America. Hallelujah. Selfless and not what? Selfish. I tried to look at the meaning of selfishness and it's being concerned excessively or exclusively for oneself or one's own advantage, pleasure, or welfare, regardless of others. All you think about is you. Me and myself. That's all you think about. You don't think about anybody else. For a moment, you feel you're an island. You don't need anybody to survive. Even the greatest nation in this world need other people to survive. America that sees itself as, as the superpower of the world needs China. Even when people say, you know what? We're going to make America great again and bring jobs to America. Check them out because, you know what? All their businesses are in China. That is why the only person you can trust is God and not man. Bible says, do not put your trust in man. Amen? Selfless and not selfish. And I'm not being political. You can vote for whoever you feel led to vote. I'm not endorsing anybody. For those who would take my message out of context, you are liberty to vote for anybody. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's talk a little bit. I feel the power of God in this room. I feel that somebody in this room that has been afflicted for so long is going to be set free. Somebody is going to be set free. Completely. In the name of Jesus. Mm. Look at verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're just going to read verse 1 and 2. This know also, it means there are so many things we got to know. But he says, this you must also know. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. And when those times come, what will happen? For men shall be lovers of, them, of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents. Unthankful and unholy. So you see why our teenagers are so tough to tame? It's been prophesied concerning that. In the last days, Bible says there shall be what perilous times. Hallelujah. And men shall be lovers of themselves. It's all about you. It's all about you. Bible says in the last days, this is what is going to happen. Everybody is going to be self-centered. But may that never be said of the children of God. That we are self-centered. Because it's not about us. Tell somebody it's not about us. It is about him. Who died for the whole world. It is never about us. Glory to Jesus. Selfless and not selfish. I look at some of the signs that happens when we begin to become selfish. One of the signs is competition. I want to do better than him. If he got that, I'm also going to prove that I can do better than him. In the kingdom of our God, there is no competition. <laughs> there is no competition in this kingdom. There is complementing in this kingdom. That is what God has called us to do, to complement each other and not to compete against each other. 
You have something I don't have, you bring it to the table so I become blessed. I have something you don't have, so I bring it to the table so you become blessed. Not everybody can preach. At least we saw it yesterday during the ordination, that even reading autobiography is not an easy thing. So it's not everybody that will preach. But that doesn't make those who don't preach any less. Because there is something you can do that I can also not do. So why do we set ourselves up for competition? We are supposed to complement each other. Look somebody in the face and say, I am here to compliment you. I am here to make you complete. And not to compete with you. Mm. Come with me to the book of Luke chapter 9. And verse number 23, we read through to 26. Did you find it? And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him do what? What should he do? He should deny himself. Deny yourself. And take up what? Your cross. You saw our pastors take up their cross yesterday. And it is not just cross hanging around your neck. It must be a lifestyle. Wherever you go, you must understand you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And you must represent the cross of Jesus. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Did you see that? It is occasionally. You must take it what? Daily. There are some of us that want to be Christians on part-time basis. And I love something somebody said. How can you win <laughs> as a Christian when you are conducting your life as a part-time Christian and waging war against the devil that is a full-time devil? You're not going to win. The guy is full-time. And you are part-time. Part-time, part-timers don't have all benefits. They don't have all benefits. Most of them don't even get medicals. They don't get 401k. They don't get all the benefits because well, you're part-time. In that same way, if you're a part-time Christian, you don't get full benefits. Oh, yeah. Some of us are part-time. Part-time meaning we occasionally come to church. Whilst the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. As it is the attitude of some. That is what the scriptures say. You're a part-time Christian if you only come to church occasionally. You're a part-time Christian when you give an offering to God when God gives you a big check. You're a part-time Christian when you don't pay your tithe. You're a part-time Christian when you pay something that you call tight, that is not 10%. You just pay something and you label it as tight. Yet it is not 10%. It is not tight. You're a part-time Christian when you barely pray in a day. He says this thing must be what? Daily. You're a part-time Christian when you occasionally try to figure out where you left your Bible the last time. You are a part-time Christian when you don't remember the last time you closed your eyes to seek the face of God. You were a part-time Christian when you can't love the people that are around you. You're a part-time Christian when you choose and pick who you love. You are a part-time Christian. And how are you going to win against this devil that is full-time when you are part-time by God? Glory to Jesus. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Selfishness is all about us. I want to get that car because of me. Nobody gets to get a ride to church. Although God blessed you with that car, you never saw it past yourself. This car was just for me. You can only give right to people during summer. But when it's winter, I don't want any dirty snowy shoe in my car. You're a part-time Christian. 
You're a part-time Christian. Yes, you are. If you pick and choose who can get a ride in your car, you're a part-time Christian. But what is a man's advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And this scripture, keep it right there. That scripture is so powerful. Bible says, what is the profit in this if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You know what that means? It means if you own, you have a title deed to the entire world, it cannot buy a soul. It means that brother, that sister seated by you is more expensive than the wealth of this whole world. So you got to treat that sister right. You got to treat that brother right. Because that person, Bible says, if you gain the whole world and you lost that soul, man, the whole world put together cannot buy a soul. That is why, that is the only thing that gets the attention of God when one soul gives his life to the Lord. That is the only thing that brings celebration to God. Look somebody and say to that person, it's about time I treat you right. No, tell that brother, tell that sister, it's about time. If I haven't, I apologize. Tell that person, if I haven't, I apologize. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better by you. I mean, hug that brother, hug that sister and say, I really mean it. I really mean it. I'm going to do better by you. You know, Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three shall a word be established. And anything Jesus says more than one time, I take it serious. The same scripture we read, the same book, he said it twice. In fact, if you look at chapter 17 of the same book of Luke, verse 33, Jesus repeats himself. It means it's something that we need to pay attention to. Hallelujah. The same book, chapter 17 and verse 33. Jesus repeats himself. It, it's, it's a confirmation that he wants you to get this thing and get it seriously. He says, whosoever seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. It's about watching out for your brother. It shouldn't be all about yourself. When was the last time you saw somebody in need? Somebody that kept wearing the same dress Sunday after Sunday. Whilst you kept changing your shoes Sunday after Sunday. There are some of you that barely repeat anything. I mean, when I say anything, I mean anything. You don't repeat. And in fact, you tell yourself, I don't repeat. And that's the reason why your closet doors are falling off. Yeah. Mm. Selfishness is a terrible disease. Come with me to James chapter 3. Amen. I, I want to tell you what selfishness could do to you. You see, we could walk around and say, as for me, I'm not selfish at all. I share. It's easy to say it. But practically, everything you do shows that you are so full of yourself. Look at what the Bible says in verse 16 of James 3. James 3, 16. And why selfishness must be dealt with and removed completely from amongst us. Because Bible says where envying and striving, there is confusion. It becomes the breeding grounds for confusion. And not just confusion, every evil work. Because it's all about me. I want to get it all for myself. So I would do anything just to get it for myself. It is so strong in Africa. Oh, yeah. Recently, I was reading about the president of the Philippines. Man, people do terrible things. Because they don't think about anybody else. They think about themselves. Whatever I can do to hold on to power, I'll do it. They will kill all their enemies. And not only will they kill their enemies, they will kill everybody perceived to be an enemy. So even if you are not an enemy and you are perceived, you must die. 
And the reason they will kill you is because you're a threat to them. And you shouldn't have life because of them. And in church, you'll be amazed what people will do. People will say terrible things about people because they feel they are going ahead of them. Or they say terrible things about people because they feel they are doing better than them. And sometimes they even, the way they say it, they leave you to use the power of your imagination. Everybody say, oh man, God is blessing her. And look at the car God just gave her. And then they just pass. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> but they didn't say anything. You, you don't know. That's all they said. They just dropped that seed there. It's a seed. Now for the whole week, you're like, you don't know. What is it that I don't know? <laughs> they just let us sit there. <laughs> you don't know. I think it's <laughs> and sometimes you say, man, God has been so good to Pastor Tubi, you know. And all they say, hmm. They were even saying it. Hmm. That hmm. Just that hmm. It's a whole message. It's a whole sermon. <laughs> and some of them won't even make any sound. Man, you should see the new apartment minister William just moved into. That's it. No way. No comment. And the brother hasn't done anything. The brother has been faithful. The Lord is blessing him. But because you didn't get it, he doesn't deserve it. It is selfishness. And so I would do anything to tear him down. I would do anything to destroy him. I would do anything to stain his reputation. But thank God we are not here to build reputation because the man we serve never had any. We are here to build character. And that was one thing I wanted to tell those who were ordained yesterday. That you see, all the gifts God has given you would promote you. But what sustains you is your character. Amen. So people will do all kinds of things because of selfishness. Selfishness. But thank God for his deliverance. Bible says where there is selfishness, it becomes a place where the enemy thrives. The enemy will thrive because now we don't see anything good. We are suspicious of everybody's blessing. We don't believe anymore. You know, I got to a place, I realized that people who criticize our blessings are people that God has never blessed before. So they don't believe that God can bless. Because you see God blessing people and people are still talking evil about the blessing God is blessing them with. They condemn what they never had. And it's because they have never experienced the blessings of God. And as a matter of fact, all they've ever had in life is what they've earned. They've never experienced grace. Because with grace you don't earn, it is freely given. So in this kingdom, God is able to give us things we don't deserve. And he gives it to us all day. All day, we experience his grace. Hallelujah. The book of Proverbs chapter 18 And I believe some people in this room needs to be prayed for. So I'm going to make this sermon short. I try to beat the record of Bishop Gerald. I already went past it. Now I'm starting from now. That was the introduction. I got a mic, you're right. 
Proverbs 18, verse 1. Bible says, through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermittent with all wisdom. Now, separation sometimes becomes a tool for selfishness. I love what the early church did. The early church did something that looks like communism. Bible says everybody sold what they had and they brought it to church. And everything they had was for everybody. So there was nothing like this is mine and this is yours. So everybody sold it and they brought it together. That sounds like communism, right? But that was what the early church practiced. We don't have to sell what we have and bring it to church. But we can have what we have with a mindset that what I have, God gave it to me for all of us. And that is what a church of God must be about. That I can share my car. I can share my house. I can share my apartment. I can share every blessing God gave me. I can share my money. Some of you can share all things but your food. Yeah. Your food. <laughs> that one. But we must come to a place of being able to share all things. And that was a mindset of the early church. I mean, they took it to an extreme level where everybody sold everything and brought it to church. But imagine I announce at church that everybody is going to sell their homes. And then whatever comes out of the sale, bring it to church. As a matter of fact, I think we should do it. Should we? How many of you have homes? How many of you own homes? <laughs> Being smart, right? How many of you have homes? You own it. You see the Ananias, they don't want us to know they own homes. Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> Amen. So we're going to sell our homes and our cars. What else can we sell? Our jewelry, the ladies, our clothes, our shoes. You just need a couple of them, right? We're going to sell them and bring the money to church. Will you do it? Is the word? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know what I am already seeing? Some people are going to be like, Apostle, let me pull some equity out of this house before I sell it. <laughs> and that's what Ananias and Sapphira did. They took some of the sale. Amen. But thank God for the grace of God. We don't have to sell what we have. And we can quote all kinds of scriptures to back it up. <laughs> right? We can quote all scriptures. Freely have you received. And freely. But somebody will say, you know, buy it, sell it not. <laughs> it's also in the scriptures, right? Buy it and sell it not. <laughs> I posted this one, I bought it, I'm not selling it for the church. Amen. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You see, you cannot be in this kingdom and all you think about is yourself. Everybody at some point in their life begins to think that way, especially when age is catching up with you. Oh yeah, when age is catching up with you, you begin to ask yourself questions. What have I been able to acquire for myself? You do. How many of you have asked yourself that question before? I'm growing. What have I acquired for myself? You do. You come to that place. Yeah. This week, one of our young men walked up to me and said, Apostle, this is all my savings. The Lord is telling me to give all my money to the church. I put $5,000 towards the church van we just bought. And I'm sowing the rest on Sunday. And I'm starting from zero. Now when he said that to me, I just looked at him and smiled. 
Because it takes conviction and clarity to do such crazy things. But look at what the scripture says because it's going to open your eyes to something that you need to know. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 24. Because it's, it's, it's a secret in the kingdom of God we must understand. When you understand this, you don't seek what you need for yourself. Because you understand that when you seek that which is needed by people... This person could have said, you know what, I have my car that I come to church with every day. If the church needs church van to pick people who don't have cars, it's their business. In fact, those who need a church van should be the ones contributing. But he contributed the biggest amount towards it. Isn't that amazing? And the people that actually need the van are like, whatever, let them buy it for us. They need us to come to church. You will remain in that situation financially and every department of your life for a long time to come because you don't understand kingdom principle. <laughs> Bible says, let no man seek his own, but every man must seek what? Another man's wealth. It's a kingdom principle. You see, when everything around you becomes cool, you don't care about what goes on with other people. You don't care. I'm not hungry, so I don't know what it means to be hungry. Some of us are blessed to the extent that our kids don't have to go through the things we went through. I went through some terrible things in life. I used to live with a terrible aunt that sometimes the only punishment I got as a teenager misbehaving was to be withheld from eating food. Starvation. Yeah, I went through things. <laughs> wow but you know what I thank God for that experience I lived with her for almost 12 years I remember one time I was so hungry she was talking to me and I passed out and I hit my face on the dining table she was eating her food from. And because of that, I hit my lips. I have, a, I have the stitches still on my lips. And I passed out not because I was sick. I was just hungry. And after I passed out, I could hear them saying, bring him food, bring him food, bring him food. <laughs> and I was like, I knew this thing works. I'll be passing out every day. I'll be passing out every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they brought the food I couldn't eat because I was bleeding and I had this cut and I was in pain and all that. But listen, I don't have to do the same thing to my kids. But sometimes I feel like doing some stuff to them because I went through some stuff. Because there is that part of me. I feel they get it so easy. Growing up, I didn't have anything called toy. I didn't have any game. Man, growing up, the only thing that family had was a small, I don't know if it was 12 or 40 inch black and white TV. And if you don't know and you misbehave in the evening, you will go and sleep prematurely. You are not watching that 14 inch. Because that TV is not just for the house, it's for the whole community. Oh. They put it on what we call the veranda. Do you know what is veranda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole veranda is full of about 50 people. And you know, the veranda has a wall. You have people standing behind the wall and breathing over your shoulder and watching. And the kids are sitting on the floor, some hiding under tables and watching 14 inch black and white. And God help you if you did anything wrong that day. Three days, you are not watching that box. I'm telling you. And it's a painful thing. You see, in America, we got everything for free. Yeah. You know, in Africa, sometimes your, your siblings go to school in the morning. Some of us go in the afternoon. And some of you have to wait for them to come so you take their shoes to go to school. And sometimes when they are delayed, you have to meet them halfway and take their shoes and go. Hey. 
you guys haven't seen anything. That's why you don't know how to share. Yeah. Look, when I got born again, there were some Sundays that I had to go ask my friend for a shirt to go to church. Shirt. And you know, in Africa, we don't go to Macy's, Marshalls. We, we have even high-end, uh, what do they call it? Um, when you go to the um, Salvation Army, what do you call the clothing they sell? Thrift. Thrift. That's the word I'm looking for. In Ghana, our thrift is different. We call it bend down boutique. You have to bend down because the stuff are all on the floor. You have to bend down and select what you need. Bend down boutique. That's how they call it. Yeah. Yeah, we got, we've been through some stuff. And these are beat up clothes. Imported from the US. And they have the audacity to tell you this is first selection. They have categories. This is fair selection. And those are more expensive. And the only thing that makes it fair selection is because they've put so much starch into it. And they've ironed it. And the line in their pants can actually cut you. That's what makes it fair selection. Yeah, that's it. And they had special places you could go to and buy those stuff. Thema station, tea as they call it. They don't even say thema station. And sometimes you'll be busy picking up, then somebody will tap you and say, hey brother, what are you doing here? And you're, you too, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. But these days, the kids want you to take them to Food Lock. I didn't know anything like sneakers. What I knew, knew was Kambu. You know Kambu. <laughs> That's what we used to wear. Yeah. We used to wear some shoes, Bishop. Depending on the weather, the size changes. A size A shoe, if the weather becomes very hot, becomes size 12. Because they are expandables and it was no movie. They were shoes. No, seriously. As the sun's intensity increased, the shoe size expanded. One size fits all. Building the foundations for many generations. <laughs> I tell you, that shoe will be good for many generations. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Let's read a scripture. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Be your brother's keeper. Be your brother's keeper. Hallelujah. And you see, I was talking earlier on how we could get to a place in life and we begin to question, what is it that I've been able to attain for myself? What you want to be able to attain first and foremost is your ability to seek the welfare of others. Peter got to that place. He went to Jesus one day and said, you know what, we've been doing this church business for quite a while. We've left our wives. We've left our children. We barely go home to even enjoy the houses we've bought and we pay mortgage on. What is in it for us? He asked Jesus. He said, what is in it for us? And do you remember what Jesus said to him? He said, nobody, living wife, living children, living the comfort of their home, their family, and everything they have for the sake of this kingdom will not be blessed. So there is a blessing for us. When we seek the welfare of others, don't let your past become a standard of doing good. Sometimes we are like, I've been through tough times for you to go through. You don't know things I've been through. This small thing, you are crying. Now, some of us have been through some rough areas in our lives. So, we become insensitive to the challenges people go through. But why do you have to reinvent the wheel? Why does that person have to go through the same thing if God has given you that which he needs? It becomes a punishment. Bible says, what kind of a Christian are you when a brother comes home to you and says, I'm hungry, and you have food, and you tell him, go, I'm praying with you, the Lord will do it. <laughs> what kind of prayer is that? That prayer was answered long before the brother came to talk to you. And the answer to that prayer is the food in your fridge. So what prayer are you going to pray again? The Lord provided a long time. 
But that's what we do, right? The Lord help us. Philippians chapter 2, and let's wrap this up and we pray. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. When you are full of love, selfishness suddenly disappears. 2 verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better. So I don't even have to treat you like myself. I got to treat you better than myself. Wow. Did you get that? I got to treat you better than myself. You know what that means? If I want to bless you with a new pair of shoes, I don't have to look at the worst collection I have. Because I got to treat you better. It means I have to take time off. I think Sister Janice needs to be blessed with a shoe. I take time off, like the way I take time off for myself to go shop for that shoe. I got to take time off to shop for Sister Janice's shoe. That's what I got to do. I don't have to go to my closet and look for the ones that I don't like. The ones that look horrible. Most of the time, that's what we do. Oh, this I can give away. That one, no. But that's what we do. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You see, we can stand here and pray all week. But some of these basic things got to be done. Because they also have their place of releasing blessings. It's not everything that comes by praying. Some things come by obeying kingdom principles. It does. Hallelujah. So you got to treat somebody better than yourself. Give me the book of Numbers chapter 20. And I'll read that. And hopefully one more scripture and uh, we'll stand to pray. Numbers chapter 20. Do you have NIV version? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps. No, okay, give me whatever you got. Numbers 20 verse 14. And we're going to read all the way through to, let's see if we could do up to 21. Look at what the Bible says. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Say king of Edom. Thou sayest thy brother Israel. Now, I need you to understand that Edom was the brother of Jacob. And we know Jacob to be who? Israel, right? So, this is Moses sending a message to the king of Israel's brother. Thou sayest thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that have befallen us. He's telling him their story. Let's keep on run through quickly, how our fathers went down into Egypt and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time and Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. 16. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and had brought us forth out of Egypt and behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost part of thy border. Please get a story. Let us pass. He's asking for permission to pass through with the children of Israel through the country owned by the Edomites. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields. He said we will not go into your farms. Did you get that? Or through your vineyards. Neither are we even going to drink your water from your wells. Did you see that? We will go by the king's highway. He said, we're going to stay on the highway. We're not going to get into your business and stuff like that. We will not turn to the right nor to the left until we have passed through thy borders. Is that so hard to do? I just want to use your highway to cross, cut across. And look at what Edom said. Talking about selfishness. And Edom said unto him, thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with a sword. The guy said, I'm not even going to drink your water. I'm not going to get into your farm. I'm not going to get into your vineyard. We just want to cut across. The guy said, don't even try it. I'm going to come against you with a sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, but I'm wondering, sometimes it doesn't even cost you anything to be good. 
But you want to upset power over people. You want to feel like a man and a woman in authority above others. So you are not willing to let go. That is selfishness. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. In case you're thinking we might drink your water, you know what? Even if it happens that we drink it, you know what? Give us the bill. We got it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. He said, you know what? We're not even going to use chariots. We're just going to walk. And he said, thou shalt not go through. And he came out, came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. You let me go. Leave me alone, right? 21. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. You see, when God sends somebody to your life and God's intention is for you to be a blessing to that person and you don't and that person turns away, it becomes a curse on you. And I'm about to show you that in scriptures. Let's read verse. Okay, that's good. Now come with me to my final scripture, which is Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 1. And um, look at what happens to Edom. Do you know there was a time God said that the children of Israel should not marry Edomites? <laughs> We must understand why God would give some of the instructions. Because they did that which really hurt God. They refused to be a blessing to God's people. The vision of Obadiah, that said the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor. A rumor. A rumor from who? God? God never spreads rumor. We've heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in Battle against who? Edom. Give me verse 8. Shall I not in that day I say the Lord even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount of Esau? Edom is Esau. Israel is Jacob. We know the story of Jacob and Esau. There are generations there after them still had contention. Time wouldn't allow me to read the whole extent to which the anger of God was rekindled against Edom because they refused to be selfless. Can I tell you that some of the challenges you go through is because of your selfishness? Bible says that there is a pocket that is liberal. You know what a pocket is, right? That pocket keeps giving, keeps giving. And that pocket is always full. Yet, Bible says there is another pocket that keeps what? Taken, taken. And that pocket is always what? Empty. It's a principle to learn. It means that route into abundance is in your willingness to give. And I'm not just talking about giving money. I'm talking about giving a helping hand. I'm talking about giving love. I'm talking about giving fellowship. I'm talking about extending the goodness of God towards you to be a blessing to others. But we want it all for ourselves. Everything must be for us. I want to have all the cars. I want to have the best cars. I want to have all the homes. I want to have the best location. I want to have all the businesses. I want to have everything for myself. That is not God. God is not a taker. He's a giver. And if you're a child of God, you must be like your father. Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what he gave. He's always giving. And if we are the children of God, why are we always taking and never giving? Bible says you will lend unto many nations and not borrow. Borrow means to take. Lend means to give. <laughs> this morning, I wanted to think about the words of God. If you operate in love, you become selfless. Anyone walking away from love becomes selfish. And this morning, God wants us to be selfless. 
selfless. What is it that I can share? There is so much I can share. One of the things God gave me is the ability to teach his word, and I'm sharing. Some of you have the gift of prophesying. What, what are you doing by keeping it to yourself? Oh, you don't know. I don't have the boldness to prophesy. It's the lie of the devil. He told Jeremiah, shut up. Stop complaining. Stop telling yourself, I'm a man of unclean lips. God can even use you in your uncleanliness as long as you give him that permission. And as he uses you, he cleans you up. Who will use a plate and not clean it up and use it again? You use the plate, you finish eating, you left it on the sink. The next time you wanted to eat, you took the same plate and you ate from it. Left it, you, you, you went out for three days, came back, and in the same plate you ate. No. You'll clean it before you use it, right? In that same way, if you allow God to use you, he will keep cleaning you. Because sometimes we are like, I want to get totally clean before I allow God to use me. As you, the more you allow God to use you, the more he cleanses you. As he's using you, he's cleaning you. As he's using you, he's perfecting you. That is how we get cleansed. When we allow God to begin to use us. And allow God to use you even in this state. And as you allow him to do that, you become a better person. And a better vessel for the use of the master. Let's rise up on our feet. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Mm. There's been an anointing standing in this room right from the time of worship.